Hello everyone, this is Rona from eMaint, a member of the Fluke family, and thank you for joining us for this month's Best Practices webinar. And I'd like to start just briefly clarifying the purpose of our um, Best Practices webinars, because as you know, as providers of hardware um, and software, we offer quite a wide array of webinars, including product training and demonstrations. But in our Best Practices webinar series, it's less about specific products or training and more on maintenance strategies that really help improve operations. And so toward that end, we invite speakers with a variety of backgrounds to share their knowledge. And I'm really pleased to have with me today a new guest speaker, and that's Dave O'Reilly, who's the CEO of SHAD, who recently became part of the Fluke family as well. And he's going to be presenting today's topic, data integration and work mobility. So I'd like to introduce you to Dave. And Dave, thanks for joining us today. And maybe while we have our listeners, we have quite a few registered. So while we give people a chance to log in, Dave, maybe you can shed a little light and some insights on what trends are you seeing in the industry and what challenges prompted you to put together today's presentation? Thanks, Rona. Will do. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting industry in so much as for the past five years or even longer, very large companies like SAP and IBM have been pumping billions of dollars into this concept of, of IoT. What we found in the maintenance industry is people don't really fully grasp what IoT is and they don't know where to start. Um, so the trends that we've seen over the past 24 months, maybe even slightly longer than that, is people are starting to dip their toe in the water. They want to know, how can I leverage this, this concept that is IoT? And when you boil it down and really explain what IoT is, the, the fact is that for many manufacturers and, and other businesses, IoT has existed for a lot longer. It just didn't have a wraparound term. Um, so really what we want to talk about today is how do you leverage the data that's available to you and also if that data isn't available to you, how do you handle those challenges and what benefits you might get. Um, and I'll also talk later a little bit about some customer case studies and people who have implemented this technology. Excellent. Okay, well before we get started, let me just go through a few quick housekeeping items for our listeners. Today's session is being recorded um, and we'll share a copy of the recording along with a, um, a PDF of today's slide deck <clears throat> via email after the conclusion of the webinar um, within the next day or so. So I have all the phones muted to minimize background noise. But Dave would love to hear from you and answer any questions you have. So please feel free to type your questions at any time in the questions feature in GoToWebinar. And um, I'll go ahead and read them to Dave at the end of the presentation. All right. And also, if you'd like to receive a copy, there will be a brief survey at the end of the presentation um, where you can request um, some follow-up information. All right. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Dave. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I thought I'd start, Rona, with uh, a brief introduction of myself and how I came to be a uh, part of the, the Fluke family. Um, for the last four years I was Chief Executive Officer at SHAD um, and we'll talk a little bit about SHAD type solutions, not specifically the our solution today. Um, but at the midpoint of last year uh, we sold our business to, to Fluke Corporation. And that's a, a very interesting development because it brings together uh, the power of the e-main CMMS, the power of the tools and connected sensors that are available from Fluke, um, but also, of course, uh, the, the power of our solution, which allows you to take operational and automation data into, uh, into your business system. Um, I have 15 years experience in software sales. Actually, it's, it's, it's tipping up now towards 20 years experience. I don't like to admit that too often. Um, but my specific area of focus has always been around delivering operational and productivity improvement through the use of technology, whether that's mobile technology or other available data sources. So it's not about replacing people, it's about improving the work experience for those people and allowing them to carry out 
better actions on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. I'm very pleased now to be part of the, the Flute Corporation and to um, to push this forward into uh, not only the e-main customer base, but beyond that as well, because I think we have a really interesting family set of solutions. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on what is IoT, um, because I think that's a question that is raised quite often. We're going to look at the challenges in today's environments and the minimum requirements to leverage IoT uh, in most environments. And I'll then talk a little bit about once we leverage uh, the Internet of Things or available data, how do we support that predictive journey, that move from reactive maintenance towards uh, predictive maintenance? At the midpoint of the presentation, we have a brief poll, which we'd invite you all to get involved in, um, and we'll take your answers to those uh, those questions, and we'll try then to to make sure that the rest of the case study or the rest of the presentation um, reflects the the key points that you're thinking about within your business. I'm going to take you through a case study of this type of technology that was implemented at, at Honda in North America um, because there's some very interesting key learnings there and tips for getting started. And we'll talk about uh, automatic meter reading as an approach for um, somewhere where you can, as I, I like to use the phrase, dip your toe in the IoT world and get started. Um, right at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, and I would invite you all to, uh, to throw those at me. I can't say I'll be able to answer them all, but um, certainly I'll do my best. And when we can't, we'll take those questions offline and revert to you with those answers. So, let me just change my slide here. So what is IoT? Um, I decided that I would, uh, I would actually take this um, definition from Wikipedia because it's uh, everywhere you look for a definition of IoT you get a slightly different answer as to what it is. So the Internet of Things is a network of physical objects or things embedded with electronics, software, sensors and connectivity to enable objects to exchange data with the production operator and or connected devices. Experts estimate that the IoT will consist of almost 50 billion objects by 2020. I think for the purposes of our presentation today, we're going to focus on the industrial IoT. And I think this is where it becomes slightly difficult for us in manufacturing to stay abreast of all the moves that are happening within this industry. And that, that's purely because IoT not only now applies to a robot in an automotive manufacturing plant, but it also applies to your home refrigerator. So we're really going to focus on how can you leverage it to make better and more informed maintenance decisions. So the challenge that is facing us all is that the industry and the amount of data has changed dramatically in a very short space of time. From the production of the Model T Ford to the fully automated environments we see in automation now, the complexity of those environments has increased and therefore the importance of the decisions we make from a maintenance perspective has also increased. So the variety the volume and the velocity of data, all of these things has uh, increased exponentially. And what we need to be able to do is to make informed decisions based on this data. And that sometimes is overwhelming. Um, you can have literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of data hitting your SCADA systems or hitting your available sphere of operations in any one minute. and Deciding which of those pieces of data you need to act upon is quite difficult and deciding which pieces of data may be pertinent to you later in your journey is also a difficult place, a, a difficult thing. So what do we need to leverage IoT? A lot of people would say, I need raw data. And I would say, no, that's, that's not what you need. Data without context is not useful to you in your operations. So I need data, yes I do, and I need information, 
And as I build up my story of how of the journey through that data cycle, then I'm going to be able to get to the point where I have enough contextual data and enough history of operations to start make uh, maintenance predictions. So let's look at that from why we need all these key pieces of data. So I would say raw data is a one or a zero. It's a, a signal from a PLC or a piece of equipment that says, I'm not feeling well. What does that allow you to do? Well, it is useful to you in operations because it allows a maintenance technician to say, okay, my HVAC has stopped working. I'm going to go to the, uh, the GEMBA or the, the point of failure and I'm going to try and fix that issue. That's all it allows you to do. It allows you to know when a switch at its component, at its uh, lowest level, uh, when a switch is a one or a zero, it's on or it's off. It doesn't really give you much more insight than that. But if we look at raw data and information, your assets are effectively telling you, I'm not feeling well. And imagine for a second that your maintenance technician not only has real-time insight into the data that exists in your CMMS, but he or she also has real-time insight into the data that exists at the PLC level and in your SCADA system. So now what do they hear from the asset? They hear, I'm not feeling well. This is the second time I've had this problem today. My last service was last week and they replaced a motor. And my next service is scheduled for tomorrow. My sensor is telling me that this issue is consistent with vibration. And what we find in our customers is that even the first and second line of that information stream is incredibly useful to a maintenance technician. Because when an alarm occurs in an automated environment, the default action is to reset that piece of machinery. And if as a user, a maintenance technician, I know that that is the second or even third time that this has happened in a short period of time, I am more, more than likely going to take a different course of action than I would if I only had the first piece of information, which is, this is in full condition. So rather than hitting the reset button, I'm going to investigate further, I'm going to try and get to the source of the problem. On top of that, if I have data from my CMMS and I know that a motor has recently been replaced, I know where to focus. If I know it's consistent with vibration, again, it gives me additional further insight. That means that while I'm traveling from the point at which I'm told about the issue to the issue itself, I can take certain actions. I can start to prepare myself for what I do when I get there. And actually with one of our customers, Toyota Manufacturing, um, they maintain that the availability of this data has directly impacted the wrench time when they get to the source, when they get to the problem. Because the user is much more capable of fixing that issue um, when they get to that point. So now let's look at that from a predictive perspective. If we have all of that data and we're starting to record reactive data, then we're recording trends to failure and we're merging these data sources with our CMMS, I can start to make predictions based on that um, available data. And your assets are now saying, given my usage and environmental conditions and based on historical empirical data, there's a 95% chance that I will fail next week. Now we're not trying to boil the ocean or get to the level of sophistication here that some aircraft engine manufacturers do. But what we are trying to do is move in that direction so that we can, you know, very little things like taking my planned maintenance intervals from six months to nine months can deliver huge returns on investments. And we can do that in most cases with the data that we have available in our operations today. The issue or the challenge that people have and the reason they haven't achieved that already is bringing those two data sources together uh, requires some good know-how, uh, good underlying software, and of course, focus. So here's the journey. Um, and what's important here is that I'm not advocating that you move from wherever you are now in your maturity curve straight to predictive maintenance. What I'm advocating is that we start to record unplanned events and we use that recording of those unplanned events to improve our data set in our CMMS. We only record from drop down list for problem cause and remedy. And we start to overall improve the quality of our data um, 
both within the CMMS and externally um, with the automation data. And over time, we build a picture of the behavior of our people and the behavior of our assets um, so that we can move towards that top right-hand corner. And this is something that can start small. Um, I may have already used the phrase boil the ocean, but that's a really key component. When you look at these projects, they can become overwhelming. But if you start small, start to leverage data, start with your assets that where you're going to get the biggest return, um, then you can, over time, move towards that, uh, that top right-hand corner. And the benefits in the return on investment really does uh, prove itself, and I'll show you some data to support that statement once we get into the case study. So we're going to do our poll now. Um, to get some insights into what are the things that are, uh, what are the challenges that are facing you and your organization. So let me read this to you. What is the greatest challenge your organization faces in moving to a predictive maintenance program? Is it A, technology constraints, B, resource constraints, C, lack of data visibility, D, training, how to get started, or have you got no constraints? It'll be interesting to see how many of you click on that one. Um, Rona, if you wouldn't mind launching the poll, let's see what people have to say about this question. Great. So I've gone ahead and launched the poll, and you can type your, please type your answers and kind of let Dave know where your organization fits and where you see your largest constraints. And by the way, there's no wrong answers here, and the information is only shared collectively. So we're really just curious to see, kind of let you benchmark yourself against each other and see who fits into which category. Um, all right, it looks like we've had three quarters of the votes in, so let me leave this open a few more seconds, let everyone weigh in. All right, great. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the results. So, Dave, it looks like 15% of the listeners say A, technology constraints. 35 say it's resources. That's the largest number I see. C, 24% uh, say lack of data visibility. 19% say training. And 6% are have no constraints at all. All right, back to you, Dave. That's the lucky 6%, 6 then with no constraints. Um, yeah, good. I, I, I'm not incredibly surprised with the results. I would have thought actually C, lack of data visibility, was a bigger challenge than resource constraints. Um, but I think, again, uh, as we go through the case study, what I hope you'll see is that resource doesn't have to be the constraint. We can, we can do this by starting small, proving ROI, and moving out. Um, lack of data visibility is, is, is often a challenge. Um, often automation data um, or SCADA data, as it's sometimes known, sits on another island, is controlled by a different group other than the maintenance technicians. Um, and it's very difficult in some cases to get those two organizations or sets of data uh, to talk to one another, not from a technological standpoint, but just from a pure management standpoint. Um, you know, take it I'm sorry, one insight is I suppose if you look at data visibility with technology, because they are related, now you're looking at around 40% of our listeners. Yeah, fair, fair point. Um, and I think we can, uh, we can certainly help with that. That's a, that's a good call out, Rona. Good. Okay, so let's look at, bear with me and just change my screen. Let's look at this case study. Um, this is a case study from Honda Manufacturing in North America. Uh, they're based in Marysville in Ohio. That's their, their North American headquarters. And to give you some insight into the complexity of their environment, they produce uh, two cars every minute. And if you think about that from a perspective of downtime, each one of those cars is already sold before it rolls off the end of the production line. So each minute of downtime effectively costs you the profit that you may make in the sale of that automobile. So it's incredibly important that uh, downtime is reduced and that they can predict failure. The other thing that's interesting about automotive, um, which is true for some other industries, is it tends to be a linear setup. 
So what I mean by that is the car starts as its component parts at one end of a production line and rolls off as the finished article at the other. But at any point of, of that production line, if production stops and assembly stops, um, then you're, you're really stuck until you fix that issue. Very, in some cases, there's, there's workarounds. Um, but oftentimes, you're not only stopping the point of the line where that process is taking place, you're, once the backup catches up with you, you're stopping everything downstream of that as well. So just looking at the, uh, the scale of Marysville, it's about 1,000 meters or 10 football fields in length. And that gives them some unique challenges in terms of travel time when an issue occurs. And of course, you can't have maintenance technicians everywhere in your facility. So you have to think about how do I disperse my maintenance team uh, to not only effectively carry out their planned maintenance activity, but also to be able to react uh, as quickly as possible when there's downtime. So I thought I'd take you through uh, a workflow that was in place prior to the introduction of technology at Honda, and then we'll show you the current state that they have uh, right now. So I would get into work in the morning, um, and I would print out on paper uh, a number of work orders for me to, uh, to deal with. I would go about doing those work orders. So in this case, I've replaced the brushing, the, the bushing on this uh, this servo motor on this motor. Um, I've gone to my CMMS system, and I've completed that work order. And I've gone on, done my next job, completed the next work order. Over my radio comes a call to say that a piece of equipment has failed. Now, here's some of the challenges: noisy environment. What did the operator just say? Um, complex environment, how many people have heard the same message, and large geographical environment, how am I going to get from where I am now to the source of the problem, and when I get there, how many other people will have reacted to that same issue. So I get to the uh, source of the problem, I call my team, uh, we look at the SCADA data that's available there on the, on the Andon, and I recognize that I need a spare part. So I have to go to my CMMS, check if I have that spare part in stock, travel to the, uh, to the MRO and pick up those spare parts, perhaps even pick up a manual, return back to the source of the issue, and fix the problem. And then in this diagram, which was actually produced by Honda, I move from uh, point 0.7 to point 0.8, which is where I recreate and record a work order. The truth is that that last step is often missed out because I want to get back to work. So I've expended spare parts, I've expended time, and in a lot of cases, I haven't recorded uh, what has happened. If I do record it, here's the other thing that we've noticed amongst customers is downtime is almost often a round number. It's 10 minutes, it's 15 minutes, it's 20 minutes, it's 25 minutes. So from a planning perspective and a labor perspective, I have no real insight into when the machine actually went down and when it came back on stream, because that data is sitting in my SCADA, in my SCADA data, but the data that I'm looking at for planning of maintenance exists within my CMMS. So having implemented uh, IOT technology, let's look at how this works now. Um, are they actually, they, they, what, they, what this slide shows is after I fix the problem, I've recorded the data, I return to my proactive planned maintenance, okay? And I, I, I carry on in this loop of um, doing what my next planned maintenance activity is and then recording the data on a machine, doing what it is and recording the data of the machine. I think that the story is, is, is clear here that um, without mobile technology in general, there's a lot of wasted time both in data recording and travel. So um, now what the current state is. I arrive in the morning and I log into a mobile device. On that mobile device, I have my list of work orders that I need to complete for that day. Against each work order where pertinent, I have a job plan that tells me how to complete that uh, that piece of work, and I go about completing my piece of work. And at each point that I've completed it, I'm 
ticking boxes and using drop down menus. Why is that important? Because we now have consistency of data. Rather than freehand entry, we have drop down lists for every single choice when somebody's completing a work order so that we can then search and use that data in future in a meaningful way. Where you have freehand data entry, it's very, very difficult uh, unless you were to leverage something like AI to spot any trends within that data and, and make informed decisions. On my mobile device, I get an alert. It says that there's an access knuckle over torque on one of the, uh, one of the robots. And what I can do as a user at this point is interesting. I can see who else has received this uh, alert. I can see the work order history for this piece of equipment. I can see the data values at the PLC level for this equipment. And I can see the SCADA data uh, for this equipment as well. Once I click accept, everybody else in my team gets informed that I have taken ownership of this particular issue and that I'm going to travel to the site and deal with it. So they can carry on unless I call them with their planned work and maintenance. Within the application, I can then say I need assistance and I can choose the skill sets that I need assistance from. Those individuals will be routed to that uh, location to assist me. So I scan the asset, I ensure I'm there, I look at the available data that's now on my mobile device, I can check the spare parts, create a work order, order the part, I still have to travel and pick up the part, come back, repair the, uh, the, the problem, and with a single click of a button I can uh, close that work order and go back to my planned maintenance activity. Now if we think about, uh, sorry I'm going to switch slides once more there, um, if we think about the granularity of data that I now have available to me, I know when the acid went into full condition. I know when that alarm was sent out to the maintenance group. I know who took ownership of it. I know what spare parts they consumed and I know when they brought that asset back on stream. So from a moving towards that top right hand corner of the other, uh, the other slide that we showed you, I now have a granularity that allows me to really plan uh, my maintenance operations and the more of this data I record, the more I can move towards that top right hand corner and the more I can start to analyze that data. So it really is about giving you somewhere to start, starting with the reactive data and moving toward that top right hand corner. Okay, and then I return to my plan maintenance activity and at the end of the day, and this is something that we found uh, at Honda, there's nothing left to do. When your shift finishes, you hand over your uncompleted work orders and you walk out the door. What we actually found was a lot of these guys would finish working an hour early to go and start to, impl to input all their uh, the, the work that they'd done into the CMMS at the end of the day. So it really has increased um, productivity exponentially. So let's look at some real data. Um, and this is actual data uh, that Honda have allowed us to share. Um, each user at their Marysville plant is saving 66 minutes per day in travel time and data entry time. And that once it's rolled out across all their sites, 13 sites across North America and Canada, that will equate to a $77 million uh, um, return on investment. Now if you look at what they have decided here is that wrench time isn't really affected, but basic proficiency is, uh, reaction time is affected. And during this sales cycle that we went through with Honda in North America, we had an interesting test. We went with one of the executives down on the production floor and we put our hand in front of a sensor which caused an alarm and immediately that alarm uh, popped up on the mobile device and we waited and it took seven minutes before the call came out over the radio to say, hey guys, somebody needs to go and deal with this issue. So it really is, if you think that every car, every minute I'm producing two vehicles, that seven minutes is a huge cost uh, in this environment. Um, 
mean time to repair, as you can see there, improved by 30% uh, upon the implementation of this technology. So what were the key learnings? And, and these aren't specific uh, to Honda, but um, we have found this at, uh, at each of the environment, environments that we, uh, that we implement in. Know your data and your assets. So unless you're very, very lucky and you're in a brand new environment, the chances are that your data in your automation systems or building management systems is not labeled the same way as your data in your CMMS system. And what we need to do is to bring those two data sets together and we have uh, tools and a mapping process to allow that to happen. But without those knowledge bases, you can quickly overwhelm your CMMS because most cascading alarms, for example, is not something you want to uh, send out to a user if the source alarm is really the one that needs dealing with. Um, favorite phrase, uh, as I touched on at the part, don't try and boil the ocean. You don't need to implement this, this site-wide. You can start in an operational area with a specific crew um, or with one piece, one asset, one piece of equipment. Um, and move forward from there. Start where the ROI is. It's a fairly obvious statement, but again, um, one that we've learned is, you know, if I have redundancy in my processes, then let's not, not start by connecting redundant equipment or equipment that has redundancy. Where is the pinch point and where is the dollar cost? That's where we should go. Um, involving users early, key point. Um, without user buy-in, you will not have a successful project, um, and that's something we're uh, big advocates of because ultimately the users of the system are the ones who are going to make this a success or not. Um, and leverage the data you have. I, I think a lot of people don't even know the amount of useful data they already have in their organization. Let's not look immediately to putting external sensors on equipment when we already have that data in our environment. We just need to get to it, which technologically is 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 something that we've solved. So um, I wanted to touch briefly on automatic meter readings. Um, this is, again, another place where you can start, which has very little impact on uh, impact, negative impact, of course, on day-to-day -day operations. And what we do here is to take any meter value that's available in your automation data, so runtime hours, <clears throat> pressure, and temperature um, are good examples. And we set up a rules engine that says, you know, when I'm in my normal operating range for temperature between X and Y, I don't want to do anything. But if I, if I get above that, I'm still not going to do anything unless that condition persists for this period of time. At that point, I'm going to send that into my uh, CMMS, and my CMMS is configured to create a work order. So the, this is uh, focused on changes in condition that need to um, have action taken, but not immediate action. So we differentiate quite vociferously between alarm conditions, which is I have to deal with this now, it's impacting production or safety, and changes in condition where, yes, I, you know, I've done this many runtime hours on a motor, um, I need to go and service that, service that piece of equipment. Um, key point here is the rules are key. Um, we don't want to auto-generate work orders based on um, automation data. If you do that incorrectly, you can end up uh, and in one instance with a, another large automotive manufacturer we're dealing with um, based out of Detroit, they plugged two systems together and suddenly ended up with 200,000 work orders um, that will never get processed because they're, you know, they're obviously, they've been kicked off by spurious data. So getting those rules right and only auto-generating when uh, required is key to the success of the implementation of this technology. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm going to invite questions now. Um, as I said at the very start, uh, Shad, our company, is now part of the Fluke Excelix platform. And if anyone would like to know more about that or has any questions based on what I've just presented, um, I think Rona will open up the microphones now so that we can take those questions. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dave. And um, 
Actually, what I'll do is I just invite you to type your questions right into the questions feature and go to webinar so that I can uh, read them to Dave. Uh, just, I know many of you work in rather noisy environments, very productive but noisy environments, so uh, we'll keep the phones muted, but please type in your questions. Dave, maybe you can um, start by sharing. You, um, in your case study, you reference MTTR as um, one of the uh, key measures of success for Honda, but we're so often asked, you know, what are the what are some good things to be tracking to make sure that our program is improving? And so, what do you uh, do? You have other metrics that you think are very important to be tracked. Yeah, I, I think you know, mean time to repair is is clearly dependent upon the environment. is is a very key. Uh, data metric to track. The other is um, response time, Rona. So, what does it? How long does it take from an issue occurring to somebody actually getting to the the site of the problem? And of course, um, one that uh, is often a struggle for the customers we come across is accurate recording of downtime, um, because in most cases that's you that's open to uh, interpretation but without accurate recording of downtime it really is very difficult um, to plan and schedule your maintenance for the coming year because you're you're working from a data set that is often uh, not an accurate reflection of what's happening in your environment very good and um, you know the case study you shared was Honda a very huge corporation and Dave as you start to work with clients that maybe are in different industries or um, of different sizes. Do you see the same challenges, the same process, or are there any particular, does this relate to all industries or are there little nuances that are different for some of our clients that manage facilities or maybe smaller operations? Yeah, I think there there are nuances. Um, I think the way we've, you know, we've now packaged up this uh, offering with, with um, a SaaS-based CMMS means that those those barriers to entry are being removed, and this is becoming more democratized as a technology. Um, I think in certain cases, you know, you mentioned facilities. It, it's not only about reaction time, but it's about customer satisfaction and customer um, comfort. So my HVAC unit is starting to run hot, or I have a pressure differential between, uh, you know, two sides of an air filter. Um, there are different data points that trigger the action, um, but ultimately the workflow is is you know is the same. Where you get your return and how you justify it is sometimes slightly nuanced, uh, dependent on the environment. We we do a lot of work in in airports, for example, and and really it's everything there is about getting a passenger from point A to point B, getting them from curbside to the stores and restaurants where they can. Uh, spend money and getting them from the plane back to their car or to the baggage claim as quickly as possible. So it really is focused around a customer service type uh, approach, whereas you know in manufacturing it's about units um, and obviously quality of those units going out the door. Very good. And um, you also referenced uh, the importance of collecting data in pull-down menus in your CMMS, and uh, can you just elaborate in your experience, Dave, what are the really important data points to capture, and give some examples of the way you've seen classification codes or pull-down menus work successfully? Sure, it, it, it's, you know, the, oftentimes problem cause and remedy uh, is handled through a comments type scenario. Um, where you know a maintenance technician says this you know this is what happened and this is what I think was the underlying issue although he has fixed the issue um, and recorded his observations which is you know is good it's a starting point that's not something that I can use to search for um, how my assets are behaving and what are the the key failure issues with those class of with those class of assets where we narrow the field of data input and say was you know does the problem fall into this bucket this bucket or this one and we do that for both pro for all three problem cause and remedy we can start to force a data set um, and it may not be 
perfectly how the user thinks about it, but it does allow us to run analysis on that data and say, okay, you know, my motors at this time of year, we, we tend to get these issues and, and we can start to um, trend that so that we can either increase spare parts or increase um, planned maintenance routes or do something else that protects the asset from, from potentially failing. Excellent. All right, several questions have come in. You mentioned MTBF, uh, or I guess they're asking about use mean time to repair. Um, what do you feel about OEE and MTBF as measures? Yes, yeah, so, so we're doing a lot of work with a large pharmaceutical company uh, and they're looking at overall equipment effectiveness, which I think is potentially a better measurement rate dependent on your environment. Um, you want to know not only when your system is up and running, but when it's being used and when it's effective. Um, we actually had a scenario at uh, another car manufacturer where an asset was being be, uh, was being repaired or being um, upgraded every six months because that's what the work order interval said. Um, but it was actually a redundant asset, and each time they did that cost them five thousand uh, pounds, which is about seven and a half thousand dollars, um, and if they were monitoring the actual behavior of the asset against that, then they would be seeing that that asset was redundant and not in use. Um, mean time between failure, yeah, again, another good metric to to um, to measure. Um, and I think they all point really toward um, capital returns. You know, what am I getting from these assets and how effectively am I maintaining those assets? Very good. Um, you know, we hear so much. One listener is asking about organizations that have concerns about data breach or security with cloud-based solutions. So, you know, but yet you've worked successfully with these large enterprises. How have they effectively de dealt with those concerns, David? Well, there's two ways you can do it, right? You can, you can obviously, there's, there's standard security uh, in place to make sure that the transmission and receipt of that data is secure. Um, okay. But also, particularly with automation data, it's very simple uh, to anonymize that data so it's not specific to any customer. Um, there are certain regulated environments where you know, cloud is, is more difficult to handle, um, but we, we have overcome those objections in each of the cases by working with the security team um, and making sure that, that the data is secured. We use for the automation data and alerting system, we use a, a protocol called MQTT, um, which is a very lightweight and secure protocol um, that has proven to be um, incredibly difficult to get to. And of course, we anonymize that data. If you think about what we're sending across from an automation perspective, it, it is ones and zeros rather than, you know, Joe Bloggs Pharmaceuticals um, data. So again, that's uh, that gives people the requisite level of comfort. Excellent. Um, someone asked, "Is have you seen, I believe in your examples, you've shown um, IoT in use with some fixed assets. Have you also seen this work with mobile assets? Or do you have any examples where that's been implemented? Yeah, I, I, I did a, uh, we were involved in a project um, with uh, a CSX, who are a large train um, manufacturer, and they had data coming from their their mobile assets um, being transmitted up into the cloud, and then being interpreted by the uh, by the asset management system and other. Uh, they actually had uh, artificial intelligence looking at the the various sensors on those trains, and they were taking into account. Um, things like the angle of the sun, uh, weather conditions and temperature to try and actively um, predict um, when those assets were likely to fail and when maintain and when was best uh, to carry out scheduled maintenance. So yes, it is it is something we see with mobile assets. Um, I, I, I will admit it's not as frequent as we see with fixed assets because you do have um, technology challenges um, transmitting data. Uh, from mobile assets, but it's something that can be achieved. Good. And we have a listener asking about um, when the data in your production systems is outside of the IT network 
used the term air-gapped from the IT network, so I assume that's what he was trying to ask. And, you know, and maybe there's a related question here. What are some of the prerequisites to getting an IoT pilot? Who are the departments, the players, what type of technology do you need to have in place? Yeah, so, so it's, it's actually, um, I don't think we've come across an environment where the automation data sits within the IT network. So it's, it's quite normal to have that air gap. Um, and what we use is a, an interim server that, that leverages either native drivers or something called OPC. Um, but the key point there is we're not constantly polling uh, the automation data. We're not trying to get access per se to the automation data. We're not going to make any changes or allow users to make any changes. We're monitoring for change. So um, we're, we're, we're really saying to the system, um, particularly when we leverage something like OPC DA callback, is um, I don't mind what your value is, but I want you to tell me when you change. They tell you when you change, and then you take action against that. Um, when we have our technical team engage with the automation um, controls engineer, um, we've not yet come across uh, an environment where they've said, no, you can't do that. Um, because of the way we access that data, it doesn't open up that particular network for, um, you know, for hacking, which is, which is a key point, particularly with utilities. Um, they want to make sure that nobody can get in through the back door uh, to their automation systems and, and make changes they shouldn't make. Forgive me, Rona, what was the follow-up question you added to that? Well, just the when if you're if you want to launch a pilot date um you know and get started who are the kind of key players you know can you give some guidance on getting started with a pilot who do you need to involve to set yourself up for success yeah i mean we normally start with with maintenance professionals because they're the ones that are going to get the business value um and we we start by having an education session of you know what a, what do you see in your in your automation systems they might not have access but what do you see and how useful would that data against an asset be to you and we start to build a case and then we pull in uh, controls engineers and IT to say you know this is what we need now it it, it it's you know it's not often easy to get everybody working together um, but I think once you once you get under the covers of the technology and people realize we're not trying to take control or they don't have to relinquish control of data, um, they're far more comfortable with that as a scenario than a direct integration that might involve you know, direct access into their systems. Good. And um, you mentioned about the different types of assets that can be monitored. And one listener is asking, in your experience, at what level should an asset be tagged? You know, do you are you a proponent of the individual components, tanks, pumps, motors, control panels, meters, or a system? Maybe you can give some examples. Yeah, I mean, I, I think asset classification is a is a constant source of uh, debate amongst maintenance professionals and uh, and tagging. You know, whether I go down to the component parts or not, I don't think there's one answer that that will that will fit everyone. I'm, I, I like the idea of, you know, um, physical components being an asset and then you have child assets underneath it. Um, I don't think you always need the granularity of, you know, down to the servo motor level, for example, of that being an asset on its own because you, it ends up very, very difficult for, for you to manage that data set. Um, so I think it, it really depends on the operational environment. What we do in, in um, parcels, posts, and logistics environments is they have a, you know, a, a single stretch of conveyor will be one asset, um, and then the motors that drive that will, will sit underneath that asset. Um, but it, it, it's, um, I don't have a perfect answer for whoever that listener is. It really depends on the environment. Okay, and uh, someone is asking about connectivity in large plants, you know, where mm -hmm. sometimes that's a challenge, and how have you seen that addressed uh, successfully in your experience, David? Yeah, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a challenge. I think that the first point to note is that the, the work management part of this solution that we touched on today works both online and offline. Um, clearly, the mobile alerting piece um, 
needs some form of communication. What we do in most environments is we leverage Wi-Fi where it's available, but the system falls back to GSM where it's not. Um, obviously, there's a cost consideration for um, clients who may not want data plans available on their mobile devices. Um, but there's, you know, there with mobile alerting, um, there's no magic. If you don't have some form of communication with the device, um, it's, a, it's a difficult one to overcome. So we have plenty of environments that have spotty Wi-Fi that people go in and out of coverage. Um, we've still found in those environments that um, they get the return based on, on the investment. And what we did at, uh, I'm trying to remember the customer now, and one of our airport customers was we focused the Wi-Fi improvement project on the areas where uh, the critical assets were so that those guys always got their alerts and then we, we moved forward from there. Gotcha. On a related note to criticality, a listener asked about using FMEA, Fairly Modes Analysis, versus FMECA where criticality is a factor. Do you have any insight or anything you'd like to share on that line and how criticality can figure into selecting assets to monitor? I think criticality, for, for me, criticality is, is the key, uh, the key measurement because it's, it's, it's the one that drives the quickest return on your business. Um, and most people class their, you know, most people, whether they class them this way or not, will know which assets are critical to their business. Um, and without a doubt that's where I would start my efforts because that's where you're going to uh, get the return on, on an investment in this type of technology. Okay. Um, someone is asking I think about modality like if you have equipment that really uh, has SCADA data of a lot of different modalities you know vibration or whatever is there a particular hierarchy or you know what data do you normally start with? There, there isn't there isn't one particular um, the, all of those are are relevant I, I think you know vibration obviously is is one that takes a little bit more of complex analysis than a simple start stop um, so yeah. it it it, um, it really depends on the thresholds that you set up and and it, in most cases unless we're using an external sensor those thresholds are set up in the uh, in the automation system so what an alarm is, uh, is defined in the automation system and then we deal with that from that point on. Um, I, th I think again going back to the issue of criticality is increase in vibration is more of a trend than an alarm um, so we, we normally focus on kind of start stop conditions um, as the, the key for alarms. AMR on the other hand automatic meter reading could quite easily be leveraged to uh, monitor an increase in vibration and then you could take a planned action against that. Excellent. And Dave, where can people go to get more information on this topic? Um, you know, on IoT and read the case studies. Uh, I see you have the uh, your web address here. Are there other sources or perhaps industry events that where they can go and get additional information? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Shad Automation um, website has some useful uh, information, case studies, and, and videos actually, which I would definitely invite the audience to have a look at. Um, there's a number of industry events, and I think most maintenance events now um, have an IoT stream. Um, we have coming up, Rona, our Accelerate Conference in Sanibel Harbor um, in <coughs> November and there'll be multiple IoT based streams and we'll also be looking at um, and I think this may be very interesting for the audience we will be launching at that event um, connectivity between our Fluke uh, sensors and the eMain platform so we'll be able to uh, take meter readings from those um, specific pieces of equipment and <clears throat> send those into uh, e-main to launch work orders against a, a condition um, which I think is a, a huge step forward towards completely IoT enabling that uh, that platform. Excellent. Well for any of our listeners that are interested in learning more about the Accelerate event in November, 
um, please just reach out to marketing at eMaint. And of course, if you're on our email list, you've probably received a lot of information, but we're, um, we're happy to, uh, to share more in case you haven't. Um, someone is asking about the sensors, wireless or hardwired, Dave. I think there's there's place for both. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question, and it, and I don't mean to be ambiguous with my answer, but I think if you're going to move something, um, then obviously if it's a semi permanent sensor, um, which which we happen to have a range of, then um, battery powered is good because it gives you that flexibility. If it's something that's going to remain in state, um, and you have available power, then of course it reduces the level of overhead with battery management. There are now, of course, um, a number of sensors that have significant battery life and that use, although they use the same 2.4 gigahertz frequency as Wi-Fi, they use uh, Bluetooth hopping type technology uh, to transmit up to the cloud. And those, those sensors are very, very useful. The cost point is low so the barrier to entry is is low um, so a, again um, I think looking at the specific environment deciding about criticality criticality deciding about what available transmission techniques you have allows you to make the right decision there also the complexity of the sensor right I, I mean if if I'm um, if I'm trying to take complex images of the inside of an asset and I want to do that using battery alone um, and I want to do it quite often then of course um, I'm going to quickly use up the battery life of that if I'm looking at something like vibration and I only really want to know when it gets above a certain level uh, then battery operated sensors are going to do the job for me um, so it there is there is uh, variances on when one is the right answer or the other excellent well, thank you so much, Dave. This has been great. And thanks to all our listeners for all your questions. And uh, please, we invite you, don't stop here. This is a very large topic. We're just scratching the surface. The surface. But thank you, Dave, for sharing your experience with us. And um, thanks to our listeners for joining us. Um, to be respectful of everyone's time, I'm going to be closing it out. But we will have a brief survey at the end. Let us know how we did. Let us know what topics. This is such a huge topic and, you know, trying to share good insights in an hour is sometimes challenging, but please let us know what other topics we can have Dave or other, you know, experts in the industry share with you. What's keeping you up at night? How can we help? So um, thanks again. Hopefully we'll see you next month either at our next best practices or you'll see Dave and the whole Fluke and Excelix team at at um, Accelerate. And thank you, Dave, for taking time out of what I know is a very busy schedule to do this. And we really appreciate it. And we'll see you all the next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.